I'm making camshafts for one cylinder engines if anyone wants one. This is video four of the performance modifications to our CRF300L. This video in particular will be about the cams, installing them, going over them, what they do. But as you can see, the bike is already in a state of being worked on. And so if you're just jumping into this randomly, I'd suggest you go back to the beginning. We show we dyno the bike, we kind of talk about the philosophy of what we're doing. So far we've modified the intake, deleted all the emission stuff. And now in this video, I said we're gonna be doing some cams. And this is what I'm really excited about, guys. I think this is gonna be like flat slide car for the D or Z house, like this like have to do upgrade, it gives it so much power. I, that's what I think we've got here today. Before I tell you which cams we're going with and why I think it's gonna be like the, the best mod for this bike, let's briefly speak about what cams do. Cam shafts and their vowels. So let's talk about the vowels themselves for just a minute. You can think of the vowels as sort of like doors inside your engine that they let air and fuel in or exhaust out. Our bike, like many, has two intake and two exhaust. They have a sort of seat they come against, which I've drawn way, way too big. It's not, it doesn't cover up the whole vowel by any means. It's just the lips of them. They have a spring and then there's a cam up here and this spins at half the speed of the engine. Cam is responsible for opening the valves. There's a small shim in here because we need to make sure that the clearance when the valves close is a very particular amount. So obviously it's kind of like a oblonged funny shape. One side of it's very round when the valve's supposed to be shut and then as it comes around, it has this sort of ramp that it'll ride up against, pushes the valve down and keeps it open. So how can we change these and gain more horsepower? Like we were talking about in the first video, imagine if it was the air conditioning in the house and you were trying to dad off, would you open the door a little bit or a lot? Would you keep it open for a short amount of time or a long amount of time? Think about that as letting air into the cylinder or exhaust out of the cylinder. If we can change this cam to opening up as quickly as we can, as big as we can, holding it open for as long as we can by changing the shape of this, then we've got more air through, right? Well, kind of, it's not that simple. If we were to have a cam that just set this as aggressive as we possibly can, we could probably make really good horsepower right at the edge of red line at wide open throttle, but it'd be really crappy everywhere else. Without getting too into it, there's a whole, like I said, there's a whole thing of just keeping the flow right in the head, keeping scavenging working. And I would love to sit there and chit chat with about that but no one's got time the important thing is you gotta understand is that when we put a cam that's more makes more horsepower it's not always just a complete fair trade we may lose a little bit of power somewhere else maybe gain a little bit of top end, lose a little bit of bottom end. The other thing that can happen is when we put a very aggressive camshaft in, we'll also have to upgrade the valve springs. That means pulling the whole head apart and changing those out. And even once that's done, we're now looking at sort of reduced valve train life, putting everything under more load, more impact. It's a tricky thing to play with. On the one hand, you can make really good power. On the other hand, you're reducing the reliability of your machine, possibly messing up the low end power. I'm sure there's plenty of y'all hearing that. They're thinking, you know, I'd rather not do that than I'd like to leave my engine reliable like it was from the factory. Well, that's where I've got some really, really good news for you. Let me show you the parts we're gonna be putting on. Before I show it to you, let me explain something. When this bike came out, we basically could see it was the CBR 300 engine, right? It had the same bore, the same stroke, the same compression, a little bit different gearing in the transmission, but basically the same. What it puts to the wheels, about 27 horsepower from what I can tell. And that would be reasonable. That'd be a good starting point. You know, you gotta consider the WR, 250 is like 24, 25 horsepower stock. Getting the bike and taking it on the very first ride, I could tell this was a little less power than what I thought it was gonna be. And we've definitely verified that when we went to the dyno ourselves. It's only got 24 horsepower at the wheel. How is it that the, the CBR's got like 27? That's more than just tuning. So I started digging, I went through the parts fishers one night, and sure enough, it was the cams. And I saw them, I thought that could be it. Let's get those cams. But then it's not that simple. You gotta do a bunch of other digging. Is there anything else different in the head? What about the springs? What about everything else in there? And it turned out there was only one part that was a different part number, the valve guide seals. So I ordered a set of each, one from the CBR and one from the CRF. It only cost me 10 bucks and I thought it was an experiment worth doing. I just checked these out, measured them, looked them over end to end. You know why they have a different part number? One's made in Japan and one's made in Thailand. They're the same thing. There's a little bit of a casting mark difference between the two of them, but I'm quite confident that there will not be a difference. And it's really great too, because the CBR300 has the exact same maintenance intervals as our CRF. Even the valve adjustment intervals are the same. So what you can tell is that this head was really built for the CBR cams, and then they put a different cam in it. So okay, we can have factory reliability. They'll go right in with no other work, but surely there's something else, right? Like we're gonna lose a bunch of bottom end. So I found a dyno that DinoJet themselves had done for one of the magazines. And one, one of them was for the CRF. And then on that same dyno was the CBR. And I took those two dynos, kind of overlaid them and checked this out. So what we're looking at here is a small drop in bottom end power, but from the midpoint up, it's all gains. It's all better. I'm gonna tell you, if you don't own one of these bikes, let me tell you, when you ride this thing around, you're gonna be in the upper RPMs most of the time. This is not a problem. Uh, to me, these cams seem like the perfect solution. They're gonna give you mid-range and top end 
with like such a small drop off in bottom end that we may very well be making up for by the time we get the custom tuning and the pipe and all the other intake stuff we've done. It gets even better. Guys, these cams are like 80 something dollars like retail. Now, if you've never done cams or shimmed valves for that matter, I will say as much, I'm gonna walk you through this and if you feel comfortable doing it, that's fine. But it could be a thing that might be helpful to get someone with you who's had a little bit of experience with something like this before. Let's get some tools and let's start digging into this. One of the first things you'll want to do after you get yourself stripped down where you can get to this is make sure everything's really, really clean around the head and everything up here because we are going to instead be digging into the motor and we don't want a bunch of junk going down in there. I'm going to pop the spark plug cap out. Spark plug cable out of the way. We'll kind of push that to the side for the moment. Now we need to actually remove the spark plug itself. Seem like clipped in there. It's one of those where you gotta kind of fish everything in there. Okay, yeah, it's a 5 8 so We'll fit it. Right, get the actual spark plug itself. I'm gonna take, take a magnet on a stick because I just can't get it to follow the tool up. There it goes. Now we have a hole in the engine, so don't drop, don't drop a hot dog down there or something silly. There's two bolts to remove this valve cover, and the whole thing will come off to the side. I don't think we're gonna be able to get around our radiator fan here, and we could probably try to pop this off, but it's just touching and integrated with a bunch of stuff. I think there might be an easier way. This little radiator card cover here, pop it off. Try not to run your hands against these. You don't want to tear these up. You may be able to get enough wiggle around there. That might be enough to let our valve cover off. There's two 10 millimeter bolts to remove. Let's see if I can't pop this thing loose. There we go. I might have to disconnect these. I think I got enough slack in the clutch cable, but these throttle cables just really aren't giving me a lot here to play with. Fortunately, these are pretty easy to move. Oh, yeah. There we go. Woo! All right, you just gotta get that radiator way out of the way for a minute. It was this big old bump we were trying to get over. This is the spark plug, and this guy right here is actually what we capped off just uh, recently. That goes all the way down into your uh, exhaust port. This would be our intake cam closest to us. This is the exhaust cam. You notice there's just one lobe per per side, but we go down to a small rocker we have below here, uh, which has a little roller on it, and then that goes to each of the valves. Do so we have two covers right here? These things, oh thank god. Sometimes these things will just give you the worst of times. That was fortunate. That one came out easy. Please tell me the other one will come out as easy. Nice. There's a 17 millimeter bolt in here. You usually find that the big impact ones don't fit in there very good, but you want to get you a nice breaker bar, put it in there and we can turn the engine over. And we always want to make sure we're turning it in this direction. If we turn it too far, we don't want to try to turn it back. We just go around again and we're going to turn it and we're going to look over here for a mark called TDC, top dead center. It may, it may say that, it may just be like a, a T and a D. For the spark plug out, this is pretty easy to turn. There's an F. F most likely means fire. It does fire just before top dead center. So then we should see one maybe it says, here it is, it's a T. Get that right in the center line there. You have a straight across line going across each cam that kind of lines up with this. I mean, it's not perfect line up with this, but you should have this line straight across. That's what you're looking for. And the other thing to note is that both lobes are pointing out right now. One's pointing this way, one's pointing that way. They're not down. Because it's completely possible to be at top dead center but on the wrong stroke, in which case these would both be down pressing into the into the valves. Uh, so you'd have to go another 360 degrees around. So now we've got this in the correct position. Located on the side of the engine is our cam chain tensioner. Let's go to remove this center bolt here. This is more to do when we go to put it back on, but it's easier just to remove that now while it's on here. But for now, we'll just back the entire thing off. Do this somewhat evenly because there is a little bit of spring tension under this. And there's our tensioner. Now you see the cam chain is a bit loose. Now before we go popping out, one other thing that's a good thing to note, you see there's a little dot here, there's a little dot here. Let's count the pins in between these. Fifteen. All right, fifteen. Put that in the comments so we don't forget. Take that plate as a unit. These caps bridge between both sets of cams, so I'll start with the one on this side. In a multi-cylinder cam, you can't set the engine up in a way where there's not some valves open typically. You still have to set the engine in a place that a manual will tell you, and then you need to follow the manual to tell you a way to sort of stage the cam out. You have to loosen the bolts holding the cam in in stages. Otherwise, if you just start one in and go down, if there's some under tension and some not under spring tension, you can actually crack the camshaft in half. And I actually saw somebody do that when I was in motorcycle tech school. Luckily, it was on an engine that was school engine, but it was a brand new Gixxer 600 motor, and they cracked, I believe, the exhaust cam in half. Oh, there it goes. All right, and we'll just keep that, I said, as a unit with 
the bolts in it the way they were. I'm gonna go set that on the bench. My hands are nice and greasy, so I decided to finally put some gloves on so I can trap the grease into my gloves. That's what you do, right? There we go, come on. There it is. You did it. All right. Take this over to the bench. We're gonna take the timing chain before I take the other one out. We're just gonna take a piece of safety wire through it. Just go up and around something so we don't drop the timing chain into the motor. Cams out. Woo! So there's a few components on here I'd like to point out to you why we have this all open. The cam, like I said, turns right here. There was that lobe. Instead of it pressing each one of these valves, it hits this sort of rocker here in the center. You know, see there's an actual bearing that this thing rides on. There's oil shot all about everywhere in here. Uh, in fact, there's even oil that uh, directly squirts. I was looking at the cam. It's got a squirter that puts oil directly on this roller every time it goes around. But look, we, want, we can actually rock this up out of the way right here on the very top. And this is your shim. That's gonna be important later when we actually talk about adjusting these valves. When you wanna change these shims out, the easiest thing to do is to come in here with a magnet, nice strong magnet, and we just grab them. There's actually a little number on here which should tell you what the measurement is, but you don't wanna trust that. I'm gonna stick this back in here very gently now. We'll leave that down for now. That's the components in there. Keep that in mind, especially if we have to do a valve adjustment. There's everything roughly as it's set in the motor. And here's the new one. I don't know if it's extra lift. I don't know if it's timing. I don't know because I can't actually find any specs about these cams. I can try to measure them real quick. Let's see if I can see a difference in lift. We'll start with the stock cam. 30.75 millimeters. Oh, it is a little bigger, isn't it? This is 30.98. So a little bit bigger than that since not a ton. And this is something I just really won't be able to easily measure, but I'm looking at them and maybe you guys tell me what you think. This is the CBR, this is the CRF there may be a little more what we call sort of this time opening, more duration in this cam. Hard to say for sure. If I can find the specs of these, I will put them on the screen, but I've tried finding the specs of the either or cams and I just cannot find them. So let's get the new cams in there then. Remember there was that line that went across the cams. I'm gonna try to roughly put that where it was. I'm gonna have to play with this timing chain here in a minute. Here right now I've got them both turned in slightly, so I need to come a few teeth over with it. Now they're both lined up. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen on fifteen. Fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen on fifteen. They're both lined up. Before I bolt everything back up, I'm gonna take a little cap of oil. That way it's not completely dry when it starts. We can just start reassembling this. There's dowels on these. We gotta make sure we're going in real straight and kind of wiggle her down until she's yep, down like that. I'm just gonna start by just barely getting these just snugged. Then we can go around and tighten them to the proper torque spec. By the little top chain tensioning guy. This is the tensioner. We can't just stick this back in because the way these things work, it's basically this this right here, this is like a little plunger. It hits, there's a big plastic guide in here and it pushes up and takes up the slack in our cam chain. As the thing, time goes, it'll slowly get longer and longer and it really can't go back. So we, if, if we just bolted it in like this, we would uh, be putting way too much tension on the train, we'd probably break it. So what we have to do is we need to, it can be a little finicky, but we need to screw this thing in while we're putting it in in order to take all the tension off of it. And this is really nice with the exhaust off and I got the clutch cable out of the way. Hold it like that with no tension on it and I'll snug this down. Back out. Got that chain's under some tension now. There's a cap that goes over it, but before I put that in, let's check the valves in case it has to come back out. Checking the valves is, uh, has to do with that gap that we talked about when the valves are in the closed position and the engine is cold, there's a certain gap between the bottom of the cam and the valve or the lifter in this case, the rocker, whatever you wanna call it. And we need to check that. But before we can check that, we also just need to turn the engine over a couple times just because everything in there has just been put back together. Some parts are new. We wanna make sure everything's happy and settled. We don't wanna just check it like that. We also just wanna turn the engine over Make sure everything's happy. So I like to just go around a couple times when everything's new like this just to make sure it's happy. One, there's no weird binding. Everything is spinning and turning really, really nicely. That was that was my <laughs> my shifter, don't worry. We need to check the clearance in there. In order to do that, we have to bust out feeler gauges here. 
How you feeling? You feeling good about these? Um, if you've never worked with feeler gauges before, if you've never checked clearances for something before, it may be best to get with somebody who's done this. It is a little bit of a feel in there, which I cannot really explain over camera. Oh, that fits easy. 0 0.012 inches. It feels like that might be it. Let me try the 13 just for fun. I know y'all are having a hard time seeing this, but basically we're getting in there and we're checking. Yeah, if I can get that in there, but that's very snug. That's what I'm saying. If you do the go, no go thing, you might go, oh, well, the thir 13 fits, but that 13 fits very tightly. The exhaust typically has a bigger gap than the intake, and that's just because the exhaust heats up more. Sounds a little, little, little loose. On our exhaust, we had both cams but so on our is Jake from slightly in the future looks this piece of paper I'm writing is all Hollywood and silly I'm trying to make it look good and it's the silly this is my real notes right here and I don't usually do all that silly stuff but I'm gonna explain to you and we'll put some stuff on the screen forget this piece of paper here's what you need to know we've gone there and we've stuck our little sticks in there measure we got to see what the gaps are Again, if you've never done this before you're gonna want to get with someone who's worked with feeler gauges don't have any friends like that like join a local writing group do something get to know people make friends with cool people that can help you out and do fun things I've done it over the years and it's been great. <laughs> the exhaust is supposed to be 0.011 inches with a plus or minus of one. Now when I measured them, they both came out at 0.013. This means the gap is too big. So we need to put a bigger shim in to fill that in. The engine's in the correct position. We just need to pull the tensioner back off, unbolt both cams, pull them out and then we'll check the shims and see what they are. Since you've already seen the process of me doing this, we'll just I'm gonna do it in quick time. Remember our shims are right here. Come here with a magnet. There's some writing on these things, which is supposed to be how thick they are. Even if you could read that, you should always double check those and see what they are. These two were both 0 .0, 0 0.09. Let me go write that down just one second. 0.88. Okay, back to me. Now that you've pulled those shims out, they were both 0 0.088 inches. So for both of those shims, we swapped them to a 0 0.09. Intake was a similar story. They were supposed to be 0 0.006 plus or minus one. They were 0 0.008 on both. The shims on the intakes were 0 0.090. And they were both that, which means if you've been paying attention, those can go to the exhaust ones. Those would actually fix them. So let's do that and see where the things end up. We need to be real careful sticking them back in now because there's one thing we picked up these little, I mean, these things are tiny, you know? These little guys. So. We're pulling them out, we're using the magnet, that's fine. We go to put these back in, uh, obviously we can't use a magnet, we need to just place them in. I'm gonna put them all number side up because that's how they were. Same thing, reinsert the cam just like we did before. You've seen that process, I'm gonna rotate the engine over then we'll recheck this. All right, welcome back to Jake once again in the slight future. Actually, I think you're presently caught up. We did our shims, we put them in there, and now, the exhaust for the left one is 0 0.011. Dead in the middle, we nailed that one, awesome. Guess what, right one, exact same way. Both of those are just right center line when we checked them, awesome. Great feel with the 0 0.011 inch feeler gauge. I think I was able to like cram the 0 0.012 in, but it was just, yee. no, it wasn't that. Very, very tight with that one in there. On the intakes, on the left side, we were supposed to get, remember we're supposed to be at 0 0.006, plus or minus one. On the left one, we ended up at 0 0.007, still within range. And on the intake, we were 0 0.006, right on. So three out of four dead on one of the intakes, a thousand over these, the perfect, but still within specification. Get with someone who's done this before. If you've never done it, you may want to get a shim kit. Uh, so you're not having to run around trying to find shims. You make a mistake, you gotta run all the way back there to do this and that. And if they're charging you per shim, some places will let you swap and still charge you a buck or two. Some people, some places just make you buy the shims. They don't want your old shims. They only want new shims and I get that. So now uh, we've turned the engine over a couple times. Everything seems happy. Uh, we've rechecked everything. All that's left to do now is to button everything back up. A little residue of oil there, a little on these O-rings.
We can actually go ahead and hook the gas tank back up at this point. I don't know if I'll put the rest of the body work on, but basically the reverse process from the first video. Going back to the emissions delete, we have this uh, breather hose. Remember we used to have this going into the charcoal canister. I was trying to route this kind of in the same way, but it's actually not quite gonna make it over to our nipple right here, but it's actually fine if we just go straight up with it. That's actually less silliness it's doing. We'll probably actually end up shortening this just a little bit. But there we go. Even more stuff removed off the secondary air system. <laughs> And there it is, it's back together. Well, it's not back together, is it? No, we still need to put the exhaust on and do the tuning. Uh, and once I get the exhaust on, I'll put the rest of the body work on. <laughs> In fact, that's the next video. Next video, we'll be putting the exhaust on. I know y'all been waiting for that. And we'll actually start the bike. It is getting there, look at that. It's basically a CBR motor now with a CRF gearing, best of both worlds. Now the video of the exhaust is already up on Patreon. They've already seen that video. And it's a longer extended version of the video. Just like there's a longer extended version of this video and it can be found over on Patreon. And that's, it's ad free, sensor free. It's just better, it's the real version. You also get to join my Discord and hang out with me, chit chat in there. I'll probably jump in there in just a minute here and say what's up to the boys. How much power do you guys think it's gonna make when it's all said and done? Keeping in mind, we made 24 stock, typically, these things are more like closer to 22. I think it was that Motard wheel being a little lighter. The CBR on the same dyno where the CRF made 22 makes like 27, right? 26, 27. Where are we gonna be at, boys? How much power are we gonna make? I think you gotta be at 30. That'd be I'm dope. Gonna say you're gonna be 29.8. All right, y'all are y'all are on a video, by the way. Now I didn't tell you any of that. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, don't you can't swear licking Tosh. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, these guys. All right, I'll see y'all in the next video, which is already on Patreon. Get on there. Later.